Hello everyone, it's Chow here. This is like my 10th time trying to record, so if you're seeing this, it means yeah, it worked. So let's get started. Now, one of the first things that you're probably going to talk about in a biology classroom uh, is this concept of carbon and this concept of water. So water and carbon-based compounds are very, very commonly found within biological systems. So they're very important, and obviously we have to spend some time discussing it. So let's get started. So before we truly get started into the nitty-gritty details, we have to go through some of the more basic details, and that is with biological molecules. And what forms bi biological molecules excuse me, are atoms. So we have hydrogen here, and we kind of figured out that hydrogen has, what, one bond to it, and it can't really form more than one bond, although you can technically put in like hydrogen bonding, but that's not like true covalent bonding. So as a general rule in, ter in terms of co covalent bonding, hydrogen can only form one bond. So this is something that you probably have seen in a chemistry classroom. It's very important for, for like organic chemistry classrooms as well. So it might be good to just memorize this and have a good working knowledge of it. So oxygen is another one. In order to keep oxygen neutral, you need two bonds to it. And if you want to make oxygen positive, you have three bonds to it. And also you can make anions often where you remove, for instance, a hydrogen from an oxygen. So you turn a hydroxyl group and you strip off the hydrogen and now you're left with an oxygen that's negative. And sometimes you can see that with sulfurs as well. And then of course we have nitrogen, which is very important for DNA. And nitrogen is neutral with three bonds to it and it's positive with four bonds to it. And then carbon, it's neutral with four bonds. Occasionally in classrooms such as like organic chemistry, you might see instances where you have like a cation with uh, uh, three bonds to the carbon and the extra two lone pairs removed. Um, so you can see things like that, but in general, carbon has four bonds to it. And then phosphorus gets a little bit tricky because often phosphorus forms like phosphoryl groups or phosphate groups and you can get multiple bonds to it. So in this, this particular slide, it's stated that phosphorus forms kind of five bonds because there's a, there's a double bond and that kind of counts as two bonds. So atoms and biological molecules are very important and you should definitely try and, and get to know some of these common ones. But in regards to actually creating an organic molecule, there are actually many ways to draw it. So in a traditional general chemistry classroom, you're probably used to seeing something like this. However, that's not generally how it's drawn in many classrooms and in many courses and in many subjects because it takes a lot of time to draw this. So you have different ways to cut back on those drawings. The first way, of course, is just simply removing the carbon-hydrogen bonds. So this is kind of uh, type two where you have all atoms but the bonds to hydrogen are removed, so like that. And then finally, you have things for like line angle formula, which is what this is really about. Sometimes it's called the bond line formula. And you have an instance where all the carbons are basically removed, and any hydrogens attached to carbons are also removed. So any vertice uh, in this type of structure is a carbon. So this uh, little box thing right here, this little vertex, that's a carbon. And you can use the number of bonds shown to kind of see how many hydrogens are there. So any missing thing that's, a, that's like in a, in a bent, so it could be a vertex like this, it could be three bonds bound to it, it could be four bonds, that's going to be a carbon. And depending on how many bonds there are connected to it, you can figure out how many hydrogens there are. So here are just the rules for the line angle formula. You can look at things like a bend here. So there are one, two, three, three bonds to it. How many, uh, how many carbon bonds are normally found? Well, it's four. So carbon normally forms four bonds. You only see three that means that there has to be one hydrogen in that region. So there's a carbon here, it's bound to another carbon, it's bound to another carbon, it's bound to an oxygen, and then it's also bound to another hydrogen, which is not shown. So this area over here has one, bound, one bond to a hydrogen, and it's just kind of implied that it's there. So this is a method that you're gonna see in organic chemistry a lot. So if you're in an organic chemistry class, you will know this very well. 
but it's a good thing to kind of understand too for an intro bio course. So definitely practice this and try to get a good understanding of what's going on with this whole line angle formula. The other thing I should mention is that when it comes to oxygens, they are drawn. So any kind of atom on there aside from carbon or hydrogens attached to carbon, you do draw. So oxygens are drawn and nitrogens are also drawn. So there you go. And then if you are drawing something like oxygen, you do keep the hydrogen attached to it. So if this was also a nitrogen group, you would also attach the and, and draw out the, the hydrogens attached to it. You just negate the ones that are found on carbon. So those are the implied ones. Again, this is really important for organic chemistry, so you should definitely try and practice this and figure out how many carbons there are, how many hydrogens there are, et cetera, et cetera. So the other thing that we often like to discuss in regards to biochemical molecules is this idea of the functional group. And so there are many biologically, relevant, blah, 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 biologically relevant, there we go, uh, functional groups. I swear, I, I just finished taking an or, like a biochemistry exam, so I'm just dead tired, so I apologize. This probably will even get cut out, or it won't, who knows. So when it comes to functional groups, there are a few kind of key ones that generally they make you memorize. Again, don't use this as a full reference. Make sure you go over your notes and see what your professor is asking you to memorize. But in this case, you have the type of compound here at the top, as well as the functional group at the bottom. So carboxylic acids is the type of compound, and then you often have carboxylates as the, the functional group. Uh, same goes for amines, and in the amine group, you have the amino functional group. Same goes for alcohols, so you have the alcohol, function, uh, the alcohol compound, as well as the hydroxyl or hydroxy uh, functional group. And then same goes for like aldehydes and ketones. So these are off generally the ones that show up pretty commonly in biology. So these are pretty important ones, and I'm guessing more likely than not, they're gonna ask you to memorize these. And you also have to memorize these and more for organic chemistry as well. So just something to keep in mind. So go through that, try and get these memorized if you can, and it might be very helpful for the exam. Now, when it comes to bonding, that's where things get a little bit tricky. So oftentimes in regards to bonding, we talk about covalent bonds. Those are the ones that basically have a sharing of electrons. So yay, sharing, right? But there are also other types of bonds out there that don't really involve any type of sharing, including uh, non-covalent interactions. So we have coulombic, which is charge-charge interactions. Uh, sometimes they're known as electrostatic interactions. And these include things like ionic bonds as well as hydrogen bonds. So those are pictured over here. Uh, they should also be in your textbook. So please take a look at that as well. There are also hydrophobic interactions, which are just kind of nonpolar interactions between various molecules, often in the presence of polar substances. Um, and then of course, finally, we have like van der Waals interactions, which generally, uh, generally includes things such as induced dipoles um, as well as uh, complementary uh, shaping that kind of help out with that interaction. And then in addition to that, we have attractions between nonpolar molecules that are kind of getting close together. Um, with van der Waals forces, it gets a little bit on the tricky side sometimes because you can have uh, various labelings of what a van der Waals force is and um, whether an induced dipole is technically a subcategory of that. Uh, and sometimes induced dipoles and complementarity is just called the van der Waals interaction. So it can get a little bit tricky with nomenclature, but oftentimes this is one way they like to structure these. So bonding as well as non-covalent interactions are very important in the scope of biology. So that's great. So the other thing that we have to discuss is electronegativity. Now, in a covalent bond, oftentimes the electrons aren't actually equally shared between the two molecules. So you have to use this concept of electronegativity to describe some of these atoms. And what electronegativity really is, is this attractive force that a nucleus, an atomic nucleus, kind of exerts on other electrons nearby.
And to put it more blatantly here on the page, it's a measure of the tendency of an atom to attract a bonding pair of electrons. Uh, and oftentimes, um, again, this is something you should definitely ask your professor specifically, but oftentimes it's good to know the common ones that are found in biological systems, which include these ones pictured over here. So you have oxygen, chlorine, etc., etc., potassium, sodium, and it's good to know which ones are positive, which ones are neutral, and which ones are negative. So uh, oxygens generally are pretty negative. Um, and they often have a pretty high electronegativity. So they like electron density. It's high electronegativity, but negative. And then, of course, you go all the way down to sodium and potassium, which are more of like positive ions, so cations. And they have a decreased or more a lower number uh, in terms of electronegativity. So this is just something may be good to keep in mind. So less electron density will cause an overall more positive charge, which I think if you think about it a little bit logically, it does kind of make sense. Um, but just don't get too confused with the numbers. And um, that's basically what uh, electronegativity is. But if you actually want to look at certain compounds, you can also classify it based on polarity. And so we have, first of all, nonpolar compounds where using electronegativities, you can actually figure out whether something is polar or nonpolar. And in this case, we have this particular compound over here that's actually not polar. So why is it not polar? Well, if you look at the actual bonds themselves, you can see that, okay, you have electronegativities that are slightly different but they're not that different enough for it to be strongly polar. And so this is technically uh, still a nonpolar compound. So what is this, uh, an eth ethane? I think this is ethane. Yeah, two carbons, ethane. So this is, this is something that's going to be nonpolar because the electronegativities are just very close and it's not a significant difference. Whereas if you compare it to something like water, for instance, it is very, very different. And in terms of the oxygen and the hydrogen, the electronegativities are significantly different. And so there's an unequal sharing of electrons. And we usually designate this with a delta plus or a delta minus as kind of a partial charge. And because of this very difference between the hydrogen and the oxygens, we can actually confirm that water is a polar molecule. So very different electronegativity causes the result of polarity within certain molecules. Whereas in this case, it's not so different. And so there you go, yay. So when you look at things and ask whether it's polar or nonpolar, it can get a little bit tricky. But if you look at the numbers themselves, oftentimes it can be very helpful. So for instance, a carbon-carbon bond is not really a polar bond, neither is carbon-hydrogen, neither is carbon-sulfur, neither is sulfur and hydrogen, despite the fact that it's uh, a little bit uh, different. So it's too slight, these ones over here. And so they're still considered more or less nonpolar. In terms of polar compounds, you do see a pretty big difference between one atom and another atom. Uh, whereas in this one, this one is a little bit different. Uh, it gets a little bit tricky because it's carbon and nitrogen, and it is very slight, but it's enough to basically make it be considered to be uh, a polar compound. So these ones might be good to perhaps memorize as well. I think that when I when I was taking an intro biology course, um, as well as chemistry uh, a chemistry course. These are ones that often show up pretty commonly, and getting them memorized likely can be helpful for things like the MCAT or the GRE as well. So there you go, right? Just do some memorization and simple, 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 right? And some of these might also be pretty intuitive. So you probably know that a hydrogen-oxygen bond is uh, going to be polar because water, right? Whereas carbon-carbon, okay, yeah, that's pretty obvious. So try and get these memorized, and that might be very helpful for your exam. All right, so in regards to individual atoms, we can also have ions. I'm not gonna spend too much time on this because you probably had this in a general chemistry course, and in Gen Chem, you likely learned about ions, and basically ions can result from when one atom is much more electronegative than the other,
and so you actually end up with a complete transfer of electrons and this can result in um, this this kind of atom that has a negative or positive charge as a result of variation in the amount of electrons available. So when it comes to ions, you have cations, which are positive, and then you have anions, which are negative. That's pretty straightforward. This is the part where it gets a little bit tricky because it can vary between, I think, a galvanic and an electrolytic cell but you have cations that often move towards the cathode, which is the negative terminal, and anions, which move toward the anode, which is more of a positive terminal. So it can get a little bit difficult and tricky. Um, and again, it can vary depending on the type of cell that you're discussing, but for the scope of at least uh, intro biology, oftentimes this is the case. Make sure you also understand and ask your professor just to make sure the type of cell they're asking. But ions tend to be a pretty common uh, concept that shows up in a lot of intro biology exams and content. So it's just good to keep in mind, especially when you start talking about like depolarizations and muscle contraction, it's very, very important. The next thing that we have to discuss is hydrogen bonding. So this happens with sort of this partial charge and this connection between oxygens and hydrogens, but it's not really a full strong covalent bond, but it's this interaction that's kind of more of an electrostatic one. So you have a hydrogen with a positive charge, like for instance, um, the hydrogen in water, and it interacts with the oxygen, which has a partial negative charge on another water molecule. Or it can be with uh, nitrogen, as in the case of um, various protein molecules. And so for instance, in protein secondary structure, you have hydrogen bonds that form, and it can create things like alpha helices and beta sheets. Um, so hydrogen bonding is very important, and also within your DNA, it's hydrogen bonds that holds the double helix together um, to a greater or lesser degree, you also have like stacking interactions with that that help out with it. But overall, hydrogen bonds are very important. So the other thing we should discuss is that hydrogen bonds generally in biochemistry and biology involve oxygens and hydrogens and nitrogens and hydrogens. Uh, and carbon hydrogen and sulfur hydrogen bonds are not hydrogen bonds. So there you go. Pretty straightforward, I think. So water itself, of course, has some very interesting properties that make it very unique. And one of the things is that it has uh, hydrogen bonding, yay, but it also has high specific heat, which means that you have to have a relatively high amount of heat energy to raise temperatures. So the amount of heat energy required to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. It has a really high specific heat, so you need to put in a lot of energy to heat that water up. It has a relatively high heat of vaporization, so you have to put in a decent amount of energy to basically change that water from a liquid state to a gaseous state. Water also has high cohesion, so the molecules like to stick together. Uh, I'm guessing if you've done something like with uh, that penny experiment where you put a penny and you see how many drops of water you can put on top of it. So water molecules have strong cohesive properties. They resist coming, uh, they resist uh, being pulled apart and separated. And so they, they kind of are a little sticky and make little droplets. And this also results in surface tension. So we have a, um, a six spotted fishing spider over here and he's doing his thing floating on water and just kind of being Jesus, I guess. So water has these very incredible properties that can make it quite phenomenal. All right. Now, in regards to actual carbon and water and all these different molecules in biochemistry, there are also these interactions that you obviously have to discuss it. So in regards to hydrophobicity and hydrophilicity, I think this is pretty straightforward. So polar molecules that are, remember, think back to uh, you know your electronegativity levels. If it's a polar molecule, it's often going to be hydrophilic or water loving. So they often like to also form hydrogen bonding with water. 
Whereas you have nonpolar molecules that are going to often be hydrophobic, so they don't like water. So hydrophobicity, water hating, and um, you know that's something that might help you over there. And um, these molecules that are hydrophobic generally don't, and honestly, they just do not. I, I shouldn't even say generally. They just do not form any sort of hydrogen bonds with water molecules. Uh, if you have something like this, like a phospholipid type deal, you actually can have sort of a hydrophilic glycerol head over here and some hydrophobic fatty acid tails, which results in sort of a, an amphi amphipathic molecule, which is both hydrophilic and hydrophobic. So you have molecules potentially that can be both. And then also proteins obviously can be both, and depending on how the protein is folded, oftentimes the hydrophilic uh, side chains are going to be pointing up and out and into the solution, whereas the hydrophobic ones are going to be squeezed in into the center away from the solvent. So this is a pretty important concept. And if you look at the interactions themselves, you can perhaps see why that's the case. So hydrophobic interactions are generally ones where you have a nonpolar molecule that's being dumped in some kind of a polar solvent. So uh, for instance, a fat or, or oil in water. And these can result in sort of nonpolar or hydrophobic interactions. And what that causes is this idea of the hydrophobic effect. And what happens with the hydrophobic effect is you have the re reorientation of these hydrophobic and hydrophilic molecules to basically form more favorable coulombic interactions. So if you have water over here that's hydrophilic and oil that's hydrophobic, this is not really a good interactions. So what you do is what happens is, well, biochemically things kind of shift around. And when you have water that's next to um, hydrophobic interaction, so polar substances next to nonpolar substances, there's going to be weak interactions because obviously you can't form those hydrogen bonds. However, you can shift that around and make it like this and now you have stronger interactions between these molecules over here because you have water and o, uh, so OH and H can indeed form hydrogen bonding. It also has to do with things like entropy as well. So when you take your hydrophobic molecules and you push them together, you're actually kind of increasing the entropy by forcing out the water molecules into the bulk solvent. And so that's increasing the, the chaos of that particular system and therefore increasing entropy. So that's nice. So hydrophobic effect, lots of interesting things we could probably talk about. This is a good slide for you to just kind of look at and just kind of soak in with your knowledge. And um, it also gives a decent explanation as to why, again, this perhaps happens. So with, in regards to hydrophobic and hydrophilic interactions, uh, it's, it's often just good to know that it's a re you're just reorienting certain molecules in a biochemical sense to allow for more favorable coulombic interactions. So there are, again, strong interactions between molecules of water because of hydrogen bonding, and there are weak interactions between molecules of oil and water because there's not really any strong amounts of uh, hydrogen bonding. So there you go. Uh, why that's the case, here you go, it's highlighted in bold red. So you want to, again, minim minimize weak water-oil interactions and then of course maximize the strong water-water interactions. And overall it's also going to be more energetically favorable and you have lower energy, more favorability, increase in entropy. Finally, uh, we have van der Waals interactions and I'll just briefly go over these. And van der Waals interactions are kind of just complementary shapes as discussed, so induced dipoles. And it's stronger with complementary shapes, so if the, the shape is exactly the same, there's going to be a stronger interaction. And it also, if you have shapes that are non-complementary, it's going to be slightly weaker. And perhaps one of the best explanations and best examples I can give is with uh, geckos, so the lizards. They uh, can cling to the sides of walls because of induced dipoles as well as complementarity in their, in their feeties.
and the glass or whatever wall or whatever they're trying to climb on. And ultimately this induced dipole, this van der Waals interaction, allows them to run across walls and even run upside down and walk on ceilings, etc. And that's obviously very important from not just um, a biochemical sense or a biological sense, but also maybe from a broader ecological sense as well. So that's basically it in regards to carbon and water. It's kind of the introductory section to uh, biology. Um, and uh, again, this wasn't the, the best. I'm not sure how well I did on that one, but I hope uh, you found this at least somewhat useful. But obviously, water and carbon play a very important role in biology as well as biochemistry as well as chemistry and biochemistry so it's good to know some of the basics in regards to these two very important concepts within biological systems so i hope you all found this at least semi-helpful and uh, good luck studying and i'll see you in the next video thanks all